Welcome to another episode of the Smart Agency Masterclass, where we believe that the agencies with the right systems in place will grow faster and easier. Now, today's guest on the Masterclass is Cheryl, and she's going to talk to us about protecting your intellectual property. Now, too many of us rely on this after it happens, which is too late, so you're going to want to pay attention. Now, before we chat with Cheryl, I want to tell you about the Agency University. If you're in a place in your agency where you need more direction, you need guidance, where, where you need that mentorship, where you can ask questions to people that have already been there, I want to invite you to the Agency University. It's an innovative mentorship and the resources you need in order to grow your agency faster and easier. I want you to imagine if you were able to ask someone that is going through the same situation you're going through right now of how to get through it quicker. What would that value be to you? Well, that's what the Agency University is all about. If you want to know more about the Agency University, make sure you go to agency.university now. It's agency.university, and we'd love to have you as a member. Hey, Cheryl, welcome to the show. Well, good morning. How are you? Oh. Nice to be here. Here. Definitely. Well, I'm excited to have you on. Uh, you know, you've been helping me out um, for a little while and wanted you to help out my audience. So for those who are not aware of who you are, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. Oh, well, hi, everyone. I'm Cheryl Hodgson, and I've been a practicing attorney for a very long time in the field of copyrights, entertainment, a lot of trademark work. And I love working with digital companies and Internet businesses to help them protect their intellectual property and bring value added to their business. Very cool. So, the counsel, I've done my share of litigation, but mostly I work to counsel clients and be partners in their business to help them grow the business. Very cool. Yeah, I mean, we work so hard and, you know, actually producing content that's, you know, valuable and an asset to our business. You know, we want to make sure we can actually protect it. So, you know, what what's kind of like some of the myths that, some of the businesses out there have when they actually create content, put it on their website or use it in marketing materials or, or whatsoever? Uh, myths. Well, I think probably the biggest myth is understanding the difference between the, the word intellectual property is bantered about a lot. And um, surprisingly, even a lot of lawyers don't know the subtle distinctions of what goes under that umbrella. So it, it's, um, it's not surprising that people don't get it, have a real clear picture of what it covers. Um, and so I'll just kind of briefly give your audience a little bit of tip on that. Number one is copyright. So copyrights traditionally associated with something artistic, but it's an expression of an idea. So that would cover any kind of program you develop or website content. It covers blog posts, uh, databases, um, could be list of names, all kinds of things. And that's very easy protection. The most important thing is you have to put a copyright notice on the on the uh, website that protect, protects it. And it's also, especially if you have a real program that's being marketed and sold, it's a really inexpensive, easy process to fill out a form at the U.S. Copyright Office and register it. Because the big myth is, in that category, is if you do not register it, you have no rights, or you have rights but no remedies. Um, because you can't get what's a different category of damages called statutory damages, which means someone's liable to you even if you can't prove that they made profits, okay? So that's getting a little technical, but it's an inexpensive $30 fee, fill out the form and register it. Yeah. Um, the second big type of intellectual property, which covers a lot, is brand names, and commonly called trademarks in the US. Um, and trademarks are really actually one of the most important assets any business will ever own. And oftentimes, uh, I think, Smaller companies sometimes don't necessarily focus on it, and I think they'll spend more time um, working on a marketing and business plan than they ever do about choosing a name for their business. And if you think about it, the name you're going to operate under or your product or service, for example, Agency Playbook, right? I think that's a great name. Um, that's what your business is, one of your product lines is becoming well-known. So. 
it's um, it's going to be around with you for a long time if it's a good good name. So you want to protect it. Um, and we can get into that as if we have time, some reasons why you want to protect it or register it. Yep. Um, and then quickly, I'll just mention there's some other types of IP that, you know, probably aren't as germane here. One is patents. And that's where the big boys play usually when you have inventions and cell phones and all kinds of software and, micro, you know, biotechnology. Um, but uh, there's also don't overlook confidential information. You know, uh, intellectual property doesn't have to be some big formal thing. It can also be your customer lists or if you disclose information to a vendor or someone that you are in relationship with, you might need what's called a confidentiality agreement or non-disclosure agreement where that pers- the person who's receiving the information agrees they're not going to use it without your permission. So that's um, – you know, one little extra area to get into. Yeah. Um, it, so that's the kind of the overview. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. You know, I, I remember running my agency and I would, I used to use this, I guess it was this site called like Copyscape. I don't know if they're still around, but it would literally kind of tell you anybody that ripped off your copy on your website and maybe changed really? up a couple words. And I remember finding people all the time that were doing this. And I'd be like, hey, I worked really hard in creating this marketing copy. And I, and I would kind of joke and have fun with them. And I'd call them up and say, you know, hey, I like the copy on your website. Who wrote it? And I'm talking to the owner. And they'd be like, I did. I'd be like, no, I did. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'd be like, let me tell you who I am. And then they'd kind of backtrack it. Um, but you would see like people they think it's kind of like a free for all. Like they think it's like this free garage sale just because the owner stepped inside that you can walk off with anything. So what are, when you find someone copying the work that you've done in your marketing or your website, what, what do you recommend them doing? Well, I think what you just suggested is probably a very good approach, you know, having contacted them that way. I mean, you can always write a more forceful letter if it looks something that's more egregious. I mean, I have had clients in the past where their entire websites got knocked off and ended up online in a foreign country with a variation of the URL. So in that case, a nice note is probably not going to do it or a friendly phone call. You may need the lawyer to write the the, the lawyer letter, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, the copy part, I think that's, that's really it is, is getting it registered and then being able to have some little form template letters you can send out to people and just say, Hey, you know, um, and it doesn't have to be a big thing. You know, I've actually got some of that kind of material around and available if anyone ever needs it. So. Perfect. Awesome. And so what, what should people be protecting? So like, you know, obviously we talked about, you know, my agency playbook. And one of the things that I thought you could protect were kind of like terminologies that I would use like in a particular service, right? And that was a myth that you educated me on. You were just like, no, no, it has to kind of be, and you say this a little bit in the beginning, but I want to make sure people don't kind of go over it. It has to be some kind of like program or service or solution, or can you state that a little bit more? Yeah, well, a trademark only exists in connection with goods and services that you're marketing and selling to the public, okay? So if you aren't selling something, and it doesn't have to be a hard product, it can be a service like a program, um, it can even be blogging. For example, you can, you know, can trademark the name of your blog, um, but you have to actually be providing some service, okay? In the abstract, you can't register a name. And also, you only get protection for what you're actually using it for, okay? Um, And there's, it's really important, I I maybe think it's what people think, why do they need to register? You know, why bother, you know? Um, And I, I think that's really kind of an important threshold to talk to people about because, and understand, because why go back to value? Especially if you're building an agency and your clients want to build an agency that's valuable at some point, whether they can sell it. And I can tell you from personal experience, um, my clients, the clients, when they go to sell their business, they simply, the I, people who buy companies, they look for the value of the IP. Mm-hmm. They want to know what you own, right? 
they don't care about your inventory. Well, they would care about the inventory, but you know, if you're in an online business, you don't have inventory. They care about your sales and your revenues, but they do look to see what kind of intellectual property you own, right? So um, that's a, a really important aspect of of why you do need to protect it. Yeah. So um, yeah, and, and most and, and most agencies that are under the 10 million mark are an asset purchase. So they are purchasing the assets and that's real important to the acquirer. So it should be real important to <laughs> all of you listening because I know a lot of you guys want to you know, get to a place where you could possibly sell it one day if you want it. And, right. and you got to right. protect the, the property that you have. Yeah, and there's nothing worse than finding out you don't have a, a name that's protected, you know. Um, and, you know, I have... A great story about that for a client who chose not to protect his name. I don't know if I shared that with you. About, you told me, but yes, let's go into it because uh, it, yeah, it, it's, it's a well-known great... name. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I had a client years ago who was one of my first clients when I first moved to California, um, Mario Salinas, and I use his name because he's quite happy for me to share the story because. Uh, it was a really tough time for him when this happened. But uh, when the internet first started, he decided he was going to sell his um, pretty well-known actually recording studio in Los Angeles. And he launched into a business, uh, internet home computing network business and helping people set up on the internet. That was the new thing, right? And uh, he was eventually, um, he went along for business for about eight years, no problem, but he didn't have a trademark. And uh, he, was just chose the name of a river and oh, a rather and, uh, well known river <laughs> the, a rather known well known river and he put the home page of his first website was a picture of the amazon river well it turns out coincident his url was amazonnetworks.com and coincidentally within 3 months of his launching they were very close to each other amazon books Sellers launched as a little online bookstore, right? They weren't the behemoth they are today. They were just selling books. So actually, at that point, there was really no conflict between the two of them. The problem was Mario never filed for an application, a registration to carve out his own niche in his his field, which he would have easily gotten at that point, by the way, because Amazon was just a bookseller. And unfortunately, um, as time went on and Amazon got bigger and bigger. They decided to, they wanted to take away his name. So they sued him in federal court and accused him of being a cyber squatter, which was the furthest thing from the truth. He was actually innocent and he had prior rights in the name. He just couldn't afford $100,000 to defend himself in court. So um, I helped him and we did get some sort of compensation for his name, but it was a pittance of what he would have gotten had he just paid, you know, a modest fee to have his name registered to begin with and carved out his turf. That's what I like to say. It's like carving out your little stake in the ground and, you know, your plot of land in the marketing universe. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, the, the thing is, is everybody listening is when you start to get well known for a particular service or program or product, kind of like the agency playbook, right? Anytime anybody hears that term, you want them to relate it to you. So if other people start using it, it's going to cloud and muddy the water. And you want it well, crystal clear, well, that's right? A, right? Well, and that's actually called dilution. And that's a very good point because there's two things that come up for me to share with people about that. Getting a registration is not enough. I mean, it doesn't mean you have to be the police vigilantes, but you do need to check the marketplace from time to time. And you just hit it when a term becomes sort of popular. If you hit on something, then um, if you let people go unchecked using it, then the value of the term goes down and it becomes diluted because it ceases to just distinguish your goods and services from others. And that's really the whole rationale behind a trademark is to allow the public to know who they're dealing with and what product or service they're they're getting. Yeah, I mean, it's your unique identifier. And a absolutely. And one of the easy ways to, in order to, you know, figure out when this actually pops up, like let's say someone's using a particular term that you trademark, Google alerts are always amazing. Absolutely. Right? Google alerts are a great way. Yeah. Are there any other yeah. tools that you would recommend the audience, you know, use? 
Well, you can search the USPTO website to see if something's registered. And actually, one of the emphasis points I wanted to emphasize for folks is if they are selecting a name, it could be for their company or it could be for, say, a program like Agency Playbook. It's really important to see what else is out there before you get wedded to that name. Because one of the problems is it's the most common mistake young business owners make is they select a name, and I mentioned that earlier, that they spend more time on a business plan than they do selecting the name. Um, and they may then select the name, but then they also don't take that next step to ask, well, is it protectable before they start using it? Mm -hmm. um, because in my experience where probably the biggest mistake they make is to choose a name that is not legally protectable. And what that means is we have kind of a little what we call it a continuum of trademarks of what can be protected, and it ranges from strong to weak. So I'll just I'll give a, the audience a couple of quick examples to make that clear. Perfect. If something's a coined, made-up term like Altoids for mints or Xerox, then it's considered very, very strong. Okay, It's a coined or made-up term. Next on the continuum is uh, what's called arbitrary, which is when you take a term that is otherwise generic, and you apply it arbitrarily to something unrelated. Probably the most famous uh, arbitrary mark in the world today is Apple, right? Because Apple for fruit is generic, but Apple for computers and iPhones is quite distinctive, right? So, but then you move down the line to what's called descriptive, and that's where all the problems are, is because for whatever reason, entrepreneurs and young business owners want, tend to want to describe what they do rather than to have it branded. And if you're describing the characteristics, the outcome or the quality, that's that's sort of marketing puffery, I hate to say, but that's really, you know, it's not really necessarily going to be distinctive for a brand name because you want a brand name to be distinctive. Um, and because so many of your audiences in digital marketing, I, I like to give this example. I know when the internet first started, uh, years ago, um, you know, there was a big rush to just whoever can own the most generic domain names, right? <laughs> right? For SEO, that was the big deal, right? And nothing wrong with that. It can be a good strategy, right? But I think there was, for a while there, there was a sense of confusion. Well, that's all you need. But my response to that is, well, yeah, but hotels.com may sell hotels, but it's not really a brand name. And they spent millions trying to argue with the trademark office that they could protect it. And really the word hotels.com is a great example of a generic trade term because that's what they sell. Right. So it's a it's a good URL. And I'm not saying it's not valuable as a URL. And uh, but it's not a brand name. Right. It's not distinctive. OK. Um, and in fact, I, I sort of left that out. And I want to go back to that from the beginning. I talked about the types of IP. And domain names are important IP assets, so I want to include that in the list. You know. So let's say you buy, I, I know a couple of years ago that uh, Delta did not own Delta.com. It was Delta-Air, if anybody can re remember that. So let's say Delta, trade. obviously Delta is a trademark, and they find someone that has Delta.com. Can they force them to give that domain name over or, uh, or not use possibly, it? Uh, possibly, yes. And that's a an lawyerly answer. But it's that's a great question, though. It's really important for your audience, I think, to understand. And it's pretty simple. On its own, a domain is strictly an IP address. It's like the street address of your house. OK, if as long as someone is sitting on a domain and not making use of it and it's it's parked with no commercial use, there's not really much you can do about it, okay? On, on the other hand, if a domain has your trademark in it or something similar, it can be what's called a, um, it's an infringing domain, and you can get it back. So if you've been using it a long time, okay, or you have a registration. So actually, I'll back up one second and say the most important, that goes back to why do you need a trademark and why do you want to register? In this day and time, it's less likely you're going to find somebody that's going to infringe your assets by stealing your name deliberately. What you're going to tend to run into is, is particularly if you're successful, 
is you will get infringing URLs or infringing domains where people will do either misspellings or they will do a different domain ending and they will either put up something that's competitive or related to what you do. Okay. Those, and that can be all around the world because we have hundreds of domain endings now, you know, it's not just .com. You know, we have all these generic ones that have started too. So having the trademark registration is a weapon. It's a tool that allows, if you had to call me up tomorrow and you said, Hey, somebody's got agency playbook dot Australia. Okay. Dot AU. What do I do? Well, you know, we have filed to protect your name now. So, um, once you have those rights established, there's what's called a uh, there's called a domain dispute pr resolution proceeding, and it's meant to be a cost effective way of recapturing infringing domains without going to full court. And it's done either through WIPO in Geneva or a company out of Minneapolis called the National Arbitration Forum. But you don't actually go to court; you do it all in paper. So it's a tool that was set up specifically for monitoring and protecting against domains. Oh, this is awesome. I love it. I love it. I, I never knew. I know that. that's kind of it's kind of technical, but but it's really important because the domains are where you where you can get a, really get a lot of dilution going on, you know, oh, and that's why the investment of the trademark registration that you pay at the beginning is is minimal compared to what the value of not what the risk of not having it. If you take my example of Mario, you know, had he spent the couple of a thousand bucks for the trademark at the beginning right he wouldn't have had the outcome he had with amazon so. yeah he'd be sitting on the beach somewhere i'm sure <laughs> yeah i think that's about true you know, you know? Um, and, he was, and I, i'm not sure what was motivating them but i think they just had a big law firm and they were being very aggressive and he was a little guy and yeah know. it's too bad um what have i not asked you that would benefit the audience well let's see that's a good Good question. Um, uh, well, I think just to emphasize that process, I mean, I've touched on it already, but just um, to, you know, have a look and see before you really land on something and make a final decision, have a think about it, you know, or if you need to, you know, check with someone like me or just to find out, you know, hey, look, is this something I should protect or could I protect it? Right. Yeah. Um, because again, it goes back to that issue of value and, and um, you know, add, and assets for your business and adding growth to the, to the bottom line, you know, and that's, that's what we're all here for, right? Yep, exactly. Well, how can, uh, how can people reach you if they want to know more? Okay, well, uh, they can reach me at Cheryl at HodgsonLegal.com, H-O-D-G-S-O-N Legal.com. And I also publish a blog and a website at brandaid.com, B-R-A-N-D-A-I-D-E.com. And of course, we offer trademark registration services. I also work as sort of outside counsel to help companies set up their businesses and kind of get off to the right start with, you know, paperwork, LLCs, contracts, all those kinds of good things. Um, and uh, we're going to share some information. I have a couple of pretty really nice little uh, downloads for your audience that awesome. we're going to provide. Uh, one is a free chapter from a new little book I've done, and it's called Registered Trademark, and it's the Business Owner's Guide to Brand Protection. So it's uh, just got some basic information. And then I've also uh, prepared a, a PDF download, which is um, a Marketing Professional's Guide to Brand Usage. So awesome. that might be a helpful piece for the agencies if they are working with clients, websites, or client assets, as well as their own, to understand the rules of proper use. And um, you asked me if there was one thing, and that was the one thing I left out, so I'm glad I mentioned this. <laughs> is one, one of the biggest problems that I run into over and over and over again is clients not using trademarks correctly in their marketing and advertising materials. Uh, because if they're using it as part of a sentence in a descriptive sense, that's not trademark use. And so that's what this PDF does is it kind of shows you what the basic rules of that use are. And uh, I think you and I even kind of went through a little bit of mm -hmm. that. Yeah, right? exactly. When exactly. We went through your side and I'm like, no, you got to change this, fix this. Yep. So doing a little site review 
a materials review before you finalize materials can really pay off in the long run. So. Cool. Well, this has been great. I Thanks so much for coming on the show and, and dropping all the value bombs on us. And if you guys never want to miss out on a, another topic or episode, make sure you guys go to, are you guys ready for this domain name? Swank.it. I know I'm real thrilled about I it. I like it. <laughs> so Swank it. So Swank.it. I'm squatting on it. And you'll never miss out on uh, another episode like this ever again. Well, as long as it goes into your good folder, right? <laughs> All right, guys. Take right. care. Thank you.